I'm going to be on the One Source ne Network this afternoon at four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And I'm probably going to expound more about uh, 2 Corinthians 10.3 and on. It, it is so much uh, support for the scripture of what I've been teaching and preaching. Now, I know there are situations that people go through. And the couple that I had just recently on a video, they had gone through what I would call a traumatic experience. And what hits them is what will hit you. Is, oh, no, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. This is the way it goes. That's all the imagination. That's all the things that the enemy uses to try to distract you. This happens the same way when they gaslight you on the networks, when they gaslight you on MSNBC, CBS, all of them. They gaslight you. They, they want you to react and get busy in a certain area because they understand how a Christian works. They understand how a Christian thinks. The people who are behind this have taken Christianity and have formed it into whatever they want it to do, and they use it through manipulation. They flash things across the screen and they tell you this is what's happening. It's like wag the dog. They took a little girl in a situation and made it look like there was a war going on in that country when it wasn't. And this is what they do with you, with their news. They, they flash it before you. I had to take care of my good girl, Smashy. So I had to take a break. My last video, I told my husband, he was doing the laundry, and he'd come in and put it on my bed. Uh, he says, everybody's going to think I'm a henpecked husband. I says, Bob, at the age of 86, when you can do the laundry to save me work, and I'm 80, nobody's going to think anything about, huh, except how, how we take care of one another. And he makes it easy for me to do the job that I need to do here, which is a blessing. And so <laughs> it just makes me laugh. He's laughing too. Anyway, I don't quite remember what I was talking about, but I don't know. You know, I am who I am. And I'm never going to change for anybody. I'm going to do exactly what God wants me to do. One of the things that was on my heart even yesterday was to explain something. If I told you, it would take me probably months to tell you about the things that the Lord brought me through, taught me, took me aside uh, for so many years and taught me these things. And then... I know that on any subject, he gave me experience in all of these things from beginning to end, from as high as it could go to as deep as it could go. And he did that for his purpose and his reason. And how insulted and hurt he would be if I were to turn around and submit to any man and say, you are my head. Jesus has been my head. God the Father has been everything to me. The Holy Spirit has operated and worked with me. And there is not one person that I have ever met or know that knows everything that I know. Not that I know everything. It's except that that's where he took me. So people want me to submit to them and to think like they think and want me to go into their little box of doctrine, their little box of traditions, and say, I need them. I don't need anybody. And I would have to deny God 
and all that he taught me in order to sit under and listen to preaching and teaching that I already know about, that God has already given me. He taught me long time ago that I almost made that mistake when he told me not to go to Bible college. It turned out so disastrous. I knew more than any one of them. I could teach all of my teachers. I made up some of the lessons, and I and I was really like the right hand of the person teaching it. And I got so hurt because they lied on me and betrayed me. And I wouldn't have gotten that hurt except God said, I told you don't go there. I told you don't go to any Bible college because you don't need them. Don't go to any pastor or preacher because you don't need them. I don't care how famous they are. I don't care how great they are. I don't care how much money they have. They did not teach you. I did. They did not bring you to the place of understanding. I did. Now, there's a lot of rebellious women that look at me and say, well, I'm just like you. Well, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what. You're in for a shocker because you're going to have to go through what I went through. And you're going to have to obey the way I obeyed. And I promise you, in the name of Jesus, you won't make it through. Because you can't take a hold of what God has given me through the years and say, I got you. I just like you. Because you're going to get a good dose of what I've been through. And you're going to cry. Forgive me, Lord. I never should have thought that or said that. Because I don't have what she has. He gave it to me for a reason. And I, I'm not going to tell you what that reason is. I don't need to. But he wants me to explain this to all of you that think you're so smart. You think that you know so much. You think you understand everything. When you know only this much. Think of it like this. God has an aspect. He has all of these aspects. And they come like a ray out of everything. You have this one. Someone else has this one. Someone else has this one. Someone else has this one, this one, and this one. And you think because you have that one, you have it all. And God's looking down from heaven and he sees someone with just one. And he looks at the next one and they have this one. He looks at the next one and they have that one. And they, we believe they have it all. They have the power to preach and teach everybody. They have the power to show you how to walk and talk, how to do everything. Well, in knowledge of the Bible, a lot of people have that. They have it in their memory. They have it in their heart. They even have it and hold it in their imagination. But God says that he is a spirit. And he seeks such to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so they imagine that that means that when they hold up their hands in church and the spirit of God comes down, that that is where we worship him in spirit and in truth. It's only one tiny little part of worshiping God. Just one tiny little part. But because they go to church and they do this, they have it all. And they walk and talk and act and believe like they have it all. And they judge, they condemn, they fight, they destroy, they hate, they have revenge. They have all of these things all mixed up inside of them. Because when they're like this, they don't realize he came to touch them so they could go home and get into the Bible and find Jesus Christ and find out how to pick up their cross and deny themselves. But you see, they won't do that. So he allows them strong delusion. Oh, I'm so blessed. Oh, I was so blessed. Yes, you foolish person you are and you were. 
but you took it in the wrong place and went in the wrong pew. There's only one place to go when the Spirit of God comes down, and that is not run to your pastor. That is not show everybody, look how I worship, look what I got. When you are in church and you see somebody worshiping, oh, I just love to watch you worship. What are you doing watching anyone else worship? You're, you're in church to worship him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind. And when you do that, you don't see nobody or nothing else but him. Every time I ever went to church, that's exactly what I did. I didn't know this one existed. I didn't know that one existed. I mean, they literally have groups that dance before the Lord. And they wanted me to go into that group, even invited me. Well, I've danced before the Lord. And my dancing isn't like theirs. Mine's private. Mine's according to my heart. Mine's according. It's not according to a group. It's according. It's between him and I. And it's something I just don't necessarily need to share. It's something between him and I. Oh, but I'm no good because I don't go with them. Well, I'm not called to go with them. You may think I'm called. You may think I should. You may think, what does that matter to me? When God has a hold of my hand and he leads and guides me every second, every moment of my life, he's taught me and brought me through things you can't even imagine, through things that you have never seen, never heard, never touched, you have never endured, you have never anything, and you want me to submit and say, I have nothing without you. I am here, so I will obey you. No, I'm sorry, I won't. God in heaven is my head. He surrounds me. He covers me. He proved that to me for all these years. Thank you, Father that he is my head. Now, if you want to copy me and imitate me the way everybody does everybody else, oh, look, I want to be like that. I want that. I mean, I hear that so often. I want that. Well, if you want that so people can see you, the wrong pew. If you want that because you want to walk and talk with him, okay, but I promise you, it's not going to be the way you walk and he walks and talks with me because you are not me. So no matter what you do, no matter where you go, you cannot be better at being me than I am because he created me a certain way. Why he did it? I'm not going to say I don't know because I do. So I'm not going to lie to you. Why he did it, I'm just not going to tell you why he did it. I will say one of the things is, is to tell man, you got all the bases covered. You are positive that God will only come down for you, that God will only do this for man. No. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. A woman is a separate individual from a man. She was taken out of the rib of the man, but she was taken out separately. She wasn't attached to him. She wasn't physically attached to that man. They only become one whenever they get together in bed. That's the only time they become one. That's all God's ever said. They become one then. But they don't do that morning, noon, and night. They, they have to live. They have to breathe. They have eyes. They have ears. I'm talking about women. They have minds. They have hearts. They have everything the man has, except they are opposite of man. Everything that a man has to be strong, to be everything. The woman is weaker. She has a lot of things, but she does not have what a man has. So the, the, the foolish women of the world 
think, well, I, it's a man's world, so I've got to be a man. So they do everything to become a man, which is absolutely foolishness. I would have said stupid and God stopped me because that would have been me. He says foolish. So I go there. Why would God have made a woman separate and out of man to become like the man and force herself into society into relationships, into everything as a man. Why would God do that? He didn't. You did. Why would God take a man and make him, and I'm telling you, a man is far more than anybody on this earth could ever dream of what God had in mind when he created man. I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, and I can feel the presence of God on what and why and how God created man and what he intended. Why Jesus Christ walked on the earth as a man, not a woman, not a woman at all, as a man. I can, can't even begin to tell you the difference is so great between a man and a woman, so powerfully great that he called a man. God the Son, Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. Triune God, man, masculine, mankind. But God did not intend it to be a man's world in force, in forcing women into subjection, in forcing them to be beneath the man. They were intended. This is why they work. This is why they work together. This is why they come together. Is God intended for them to be like this together? Not apart, not this one. Not like that. Oh, no. Not like that. Come together. Come together. Come together. Protection. Love, wisdom, understanding, the helpmate. Ah, love, understanding, wisdom, God's intention. And I've only touched on it, just touched on it. I has not seen nor ear heard what God has planned for man. But man's real busy right now. Oh, he's real busy in puffing himself up. He's real busy in taking his headship. He is going to bring everybody and everything into subjection to only him. Because after all, he is, he can sit on the throne of God. After all, he is God. He is a God. The Bible says he's a God. So those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, think like that. They take the truth and how they hold it in unrighteousness. I'll explain it to you. They take it to their heart for just them. They hold the truth to benefit just them. Their reasons for taking the truth and benefiting just them is because they're a man. It's not disputing that they're a man, and I'm not disputing it. I'm not upset with any man, because I'll tell you what, when you find a real one, and I've spoken about this before, there are men and there are real men. And a real man, oh my goodness, they are so far and few between. But you can find them in every walk of life. You can find them in every race. Every You can find them. They're in there. They're in the mix all over the place. Because they are what you would call and what I know are real men. 
their thinking, their feelings, their understanding, everything is geared to doing what is right, what is good, and not all for themselves. Their thinking and compassion towards the woman, compassion and wisdom and understanding for the children and for the woman. That's where their thinking goes. It doesn't puff themselves up. I'm the head. So I'm going to show you this and I'm going to teach you that. That's not how you feel. A person who has power and authority does not feel that way. That's a person that wants power and authority to use to their own purpose. That is the kind of thinking they have. That's the way they operate. A person who has it doesn't ever have to concern themselves about it. It's what I always said about men. The man who spouts off of what a man should be is a man who is terribly worried that he's going to be found out that he's not a real man. The man who, who walks around and says, well, that's sissified. I'm not going there. I'm better than that. Well, that's too much like, uh, I'm not going there. I'm better than that. That's a man who is so insecure in his feelings as to who he is. And I'm going to tell you why he's insecure. Because the world is filled with proving to men they're not men. They're half woman. Because the world is filled with even this new age thing that these people that actually think and feel that a man is half woman and half man. God is half woman and half man. No, he's not. Oh, no, he is not. He is masculine completely. <laughs> completely masculine. That's why he created man first in his own image. He didn't say, I created him male and female image. He didn't say that. He said, I created them, them, them is a big word, male and female. That is two separate things. Them, when he used the word them, he created them, male and female. That is two separate things. He didn't say, I created man, male and female. He didn't say that. But you know what? Those that are insecure in their masculinity, those that are insecure in their femininity are, they absolutely take it out of context. And those who have power and authority, and some of it I'm going to tell you was never given by God. It was given by them. They were never called by God. Because if they were called by God, they wouldn't be so far into the wrong positions. They wouldn't be so far in teaching that, I mean, it's a little, a little man that thinks he's so much. He's got himself all out of disproportion that tells you that Jesus Christ got Mary. He takes God and makes God like him. Well, I'm a man and I have a wife. So she, Jesus Christ must have done that. He doesn't take Jesus Christ as he is and looks at himself and says, well, Jesus didn't do what I did. I, I'm a man. That's why I married. Jesus didn't need to marry anybody because marriage was for procreation. And that he didn't need to do that. He did not want to procreate. Well, you could say, well, yeah, he did because make it up all you want. Put it out of your evil imagination. T take the scriptures out of context and mix them the way you want. I mean, a combination in this world, in this time, is the easiest thing for anybody to do. They take the combination of life and they go like this. This much to the right and then a little bit to the left and then all the way to the right and then you got to go extremely to the left and then you got to come back to the center that's how you guys do it you do it with doctrine 
you do it with different forms. You different do it with different forms of religion, different forms of understanding, different forms of psychology, psychiatry. You do it different forms with doctors and lawyers. You do all of this in different forms. And because you live in a world that are filled with nothing else but different forms, that is where you go. That is, you're a Christian, but you're a psychologist. You're a Christian, but you're a real doctor. You're a Christian, but you're this. You, you're only, you, you say Christian first, but actually you're these things first and then you're Christian because that's only a teensy, teensy part of your life. Because you didn't spend your whole life studying and God and finding out all about God. You spent your whole life studying how to be something else, which God don't count that as a sin. That's not wrong. You need to make a living. Okay. So you have to make a living. But when you take God and use him to make your living, you take God and use him, whether it's through psychology, psychiatry, uh, anything. I don't care what it is. And you use him, your knowledge, to make money. That's a bad story. To make money. Ah, what good does it do if you have the whole world and you lose your soul in the end? If you don't ever bother to examine your motivations, you never find them out. You never sit down. If you don't ever take every thought captive to God of the imagination that exalted itself high above the knowledge of God, you see, everybody's imagination would do that if you let it go. All of us would be walking and talking and living on our imagination. <laughs> Some of us do, because they're in La La Land. They're, La La Land is a place where you can be anything you want, do anything you want, and everything's going to be okay. You have a picture of what life should be in the uh, say in the nation and you remember how great it was that you had this and you had that and how great it was and you still just live there that hey it's 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 really happening no you're still in la la land you're still thinking about in your imagination of what things used to be and you haven't you didn't wake up yet you didn't understand things have changed since you've been sleeping Things have changed since you have decided you were going to be disconnected from real life. Things have changed since your imagination told you it's okay to be disconnected. You don't have to go there. You don't ever have to examine yourself. You don't ever have to understand. God will take care of it. So you could do whatever you want. Well, after all, my pastor told me that no matter what I do, that I can and I'm going to be all right because once saved, always saved. I don't care how many times you tell me I can dirty my garden. I'm not listening to you. I don't care how many times you tell me about the scripture that says that when I turn dirty my garden, I am like the dog that returns to his own vomit. I don't care what you say. I am not going to listen to what Jude says about the garment being spotted or what Revelation says about your name being erased out of the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm, not, I'm just not going to go there. Those things don't mean a thing. What means a thing is, is once saved, always saved. He died to save me, and therefore I can do anything I want. I could take his name and tramp it in the worst and kill and murder and do, do everything that is evil and covet, and, and, and he is still with me. I don't think so. I don't think so. But if that's the choice you have, that's where you want to go, have at it. Because I'm going to tell you what, with all of those beliefs and all of those understandings, you haven't changed God a bit. He's still holy. He's still righteous. He's still true. He still cleanses your heart and your mind if you want it. And he still works with you to keep it clean. 
If you don't want to sin, you'll die before you sin. He'll still do that. I know the beginning of this message now that I was talking about how they flash before you. They put on something to gaslight you. To get your imagination to go, oh, we're going to lose. We're going to go down. We're going to have this problem. Oh, we've got to go down this rabbit hole and find out why and how it happened. And while you're busy in that rabbit hole, he's over here working on another one. Because you're not listening to the word tell you all things work together for good. So when you see that flash before you, you can say, hey, it's going to work for our good no matter where they go, no matter what they do. Because I belong to Jesus. That's where you go.